This video is another in the series for Math 1224 for UTSA. Today we'll be talking about Chapter 5, Sequences and Series, and specifically the first section on sequences. So first of all, what is a sequence? You probably have an idea, just the word like sequence of events, something like that. If you've ever played the board game sequence, you kind of get, like, you know what the word means. It's something things are sequential, there are consequences, right? So basically, in simple terms, a sequence is a list of numbers that doesn't end. It just keeps going. So you could have like one, and then two, and then three, and then four, and then five. And I could write dot, 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 and you probably know what comes next. I don't have to see what comes next, because there's a very clear pattern, right? Often, but not always, but often, sequences will have a very clear pattern. There may be exceptions. Um, Let's do a, two, a few more. So let's say, and then we'll talk about notation as well. Let's see a few more examples. Let's say if I have something like 1, 2, 4, 8, 16, dot, dot, dot. You can probably tell, oh, I see the pattern here, right? Um, how about this? Um, let's do a 0, comma, 1, comma, okay? And then it goes uh, 1, 2, 3, 5, Eight dot, dot dot That one might be less obvious. With if you think about it, I'm sure almost anyone would figure it out. You know, given enough time, you just think about different options. Where what's the connection from one number to the next? Um, so basically, this first one, I'm just counting. Right, one, two, three, four, five. This one, I'm doubling to get the next number. So I have one. I double it to get two. I double that to get four. I double that to get eight. I double that to get sixteen. Right. So I'm using one number to get the next number. Now, there is a way to just say, like, oh, what's the 10th number? Like, because then we go 32, 64, and so forth. For for some sequences, you can say, oh, what's the formula that gives you? That, that happens. And for others, there's no formula necessary. So this one, and maybe you figured it out, or you paused the video and thought about it. So for this one... Um, this sequence is formed by starting with 0 and 1, that's the beginning, and then each term is then the sum of the two numbers that came before it. So 1 is 0 plus 1, 2 is 1 plus 1, 3 is 1 plus 2, 5 is 2 plus 3, and so forth. So the next sequence, our next term in the sequence, <clears throat> go ahead and think about it. I mean, it might be obvious to you now, or, or pause the video, think about it. The next term would be... 13, right? 5 plus 8 is 13. So you can have sequences, sequences with a very simple pattern. And you can even say with this one, I'm adding 1 to get the next term, right? Here I'm at 1, add 1 to get 2, add 1 to get 3, add 1 to get 4, add 1 to get 5. So often there will be two ways to refer to what you're doing. You could say, oh, the 10th number in the sequence is 10 because it's the 10th position. Or you could say, well, the ten, I get 10 because I've been adding 1 repeatedly, and I get up to 10, right? With this one, um, you could probably come up with a formula, and we'll do examples like this. You probably come up with a formula to describe the 10th term. Um, this one, not so much. So um, some sequences will have what's called a closed form, where you could just write down a formula. Okay. Others will be defined what's called uh, either recursively or with a recursion. Some are defined, well, let's put it this way, recursively. Okay. Um, so we'll have examples of, of both, and especially recursive definitions will become more important in, in later in the chapter. Okay, so what's next? Find a formula for each sequence below. Oh, and we're going to be doing primarily arithmetic and geometric sequences. Um, uh, up here, the first one is arithmetic. The second one is uh, geometric. The third one it would be recursive. It's it's this is called the uh, Fibonacci series. So it's obviously it has a name, so it's pretty important. So let's look at this sequence: five, uh, two, five, eight, eleven, fourteen, seventeen, twenty. Now I might you might notice that to get from two to five, I add three. To get from 5 to 8, I add 3. So you could say recursively, you add 3 to the old number to get the new number, which would be correct. So if I wanted, and this is find a formula. So, so the recursion is not what we want. We actually want like 
Um, well, we'll do, oh, you know what? I, I forgot to talk about notation. That's fine. We'll do it down here. So I could say, if I wanted, that A0, that refers to the, the first position, but it's often referred to as 0 rather than 1. Different books have different standards. We'll, we'll say 0. Um, we will sometimes have to switch to using 1. It, it doesn't really matter, though. Let's say that's 2. And we can say that AN, right, and N would be a variable, the nth position, like this is position. We could say that this is position 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Six. So 20 is A6. So AN, we could say, well, that's going to be AN minus 1 plus 3. So that A1 equals A0 plus 3. Okay? So that would be 2 plus 3 is 5. But I want a formula. So I could say the following. This, this is the, the recursive version. But what if I just want a formula? Well, if, if this goes up by a fixed amount, a fixed amount from term to term, you could think of that in terms of rise over run. When I run forward um, one unit from one to two, the value rises by three. So it's like it has a slope of three halves almost. So I could say, oh, well, this is going to be something like <clears throat> three halves X plus something, something along those lines. It's, it's one way to think about it. Oh, I'm sorry, not three halves. Let's focus on the two. Rise over 1 would be 3 over 1, rather. So the slope is 3, right? So I'm going to think about this as being a linear function with slope 3. So I'm going to say that this is a n equals 3 n plus, what's the y-intercept? Well, 2 is the initial value. That's like the y-intercept. So a uh, arithmetic sequence is a, a analogous to a linear function because it has this same format. And if we plug 6 in for n, we get 20, right? Six, the sixth position has 20. Okay, so let's talk about notation. I'm using this to refer to uh, the value of the function. This is kind of like saying f of x. A, n is the um, input variable, so to speak, and a is the name of the sequence. So let's actually go back up here, because this is kind of where I plan to talk about, but then I got sidetracked. So if I want to say, um, if I want to say the sequence a. This is often, I could name it with a letter A if I want capital A, but usually I, you'll use this curly bracket and put little, a lowercase letter, and then an N. N is the variable. It's uh, sometimes, um, it stands for index. As you go from turn to turn to turn, you're indexing through. Um, if you're familiar with computer science, you would often use I for the index, but we're going to use N. So this is one way to write the notation. And then you can say, oh, well, this is equal curly bracket. What do we have? 2, 5, 8, 8, 11. Uh, I'll just go dot, dot, dot here. Dot, dot, dot. Okay. So um, we can then say that um, because of what we worked out, in fact, I, I'll do it down here. No, no, we'll do it here. It's fine. Whatever. The word to put it doesn't matter at this point. We could say the sequence an equals the sequence. 3n plus 2. Because this is the formula that determines this sequence. An, a, a variation on this that is often used but will usually skip is, is the following. So we'll say n goes uh, from 0 to infinity. So it looks kind of similar to the way um, an, uh, an integral would work or um, a limit might work, or a summation. Especially, this, this notation is a lot like a summation notation, right? If you remember from Riemann sums, you'd have a Riemann sum like this, the sum as uh, i it goes from 1 to n, right? And then you would do a limit as n goes to infinity at some point. So there's sort of similar notation in that you say where the variable begins and where it ends. So we're, we're doing that kind of thing here. So it, it, it's kind of similar, the notation at least. Anyway, that's some notation that I, I had overlooked. Okay, so how about this one? And notice I'm not putting the curly brackets on these things. I mean, I guess I could be. You just you don't need to do that every time. It's it's fine. And it, we're in the context of a sequence. I don't have to use that notation all the time. I can just write the list of numbers. So if I were to write down the formula for this, I need to look for what's the connection in the numbers. I notice the numbers get big pretty fast. So I'm not just adding three every time. So I could look. Okay, what do I add to get this one? Four, right? So I could say uh, I could say plus four. Here is plus a 12, all right? 
plus, what would that be? Is that 36? And then plus, what, 108? So I'm not adding a fixed number, but the numbers do seem to have a bit of a pattern. This number is three times that number. And this number is three times that number. And this number is three times that number. But you might notice, well, yeah, but isn't six three times whatever two is? And isn't 18 three times six? And 54 is three times 18. So really what we're doing to get from one number to the next is we are multiplying by three to get the next number. Okay, and so you might think about this in terms of um, an exponential function, the, the um, like the two to the x power, y equals two to the x. When you make a t table to graph it, you'll get out the output numbers will grow very quickly because you have an exponent, right? If you make a t table and you have like x and y, and you put zero, well, you'll get one. You put one, you'll get two. You put two, you get four. You put three, you'll get eight right? And, and each successive y coordinate is double the prior one. Um, so that's the kind of pattern we're seeing here. So this is called a geometric series, and it's akin to an exponential function. So this one, and I guess I'll call it a, again, well, I'll call this one b. So bn, b sub n, well, this is going to be uh, 3 to the n power, but I didn't start with three. I started with two, right? So in the zero position, remember this is this is um. In fact, let's get rid of this. We don't need this anymore. This is position zero, one, two, three, four, six. In the zero position, when n is zero, we get two. If you plug in zero here, you get one. So I need to multiply by two. So now if I plug in, say, 4, right? If I plug 4 in for n, I should get 162. And you can confirm that you do. 3 to the 4th power, that's going to be what? 81 times 2 is 162. Um, also, I would typically not write this in this order. It, it, the order doesn't matter, really. But I would typically write it more like uh, put the 2 in front and put the exponential at the, um, at the end. It's not important. It's just the way I prefer to write it. Okay. How about this one? Oh, and, and also this one we could write recursively as well. I could say something like, uh, I could say a0 equals 2, and then an equals 3 times an minus 1, 3 times the previous number. That's that's the pattern we saw. As I said before, some sequences will have both a recursive version and a what's called a closed form version. Some will have uh, only one or the other. Uh, some will have both. Um, well, I should hesitate. I hesitate to say that. I, I don't want to say. I don't want to say that there are any functions that only have a closed form and cannot be done recursively. But I will say that there are some that only have a closed form, or sorry, do only have a recursive form and cannot be done in a closed form. Okay, so how about this one? So you might it might be kind of obvious. Um, because of these terms here, that we're clearly multiplying by something over two. And it might be obvious looking at the 27 and the 81. In other words, take the ratios of successive terms to, to see if you have a geometric uh, series. So if you do six over four, well, that's three halves. If you do nine over six, oh, well, that's three halves. If you do 27 over two, over nine, the prior term is three halves. So yeah, there's a there's a growth factor of three halves here. So pretty clearly, this uh, say C n is going to be three halves to the n power times something, right? Well, the first value is four, so that's the that's the something we're multiplying with four. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, yes, four. Sorry. For a moment, I, I hesitate because I thought, wait a minute, are we starting with n equals 1? No, no, we're starting with n equals 0. Later, we might need to start with n equals 1, but, but in this case, we'll start with n equals 0. Okay, so that's just some examples of finding the closed form. Uh, for this one, we also could find the um, recursive form. So a0 
is 4, and then a n equals 3 halves times a n minus 1, the prior term. Okay, let's see what's next. Oh, we got some more. So find both a closed formula and a recursive definition for each sequence. Well, probably when I wrote these out, I didn't plan talking about recursions for these, but that's okay. That's fine. So we want both. So for this one, um, I think the recursive one is probably going to be the easiest because you can know that, or rather you can notice, I think, that each successive term has, um, it's one-tenth of the prior term. So I could say for the recursion that uh, a, a0 equals, whoops, a0 equals 5, right? And then a n equals 0 0.1 times a n minus 1. Right, so how do I write that in a closed form? Um, a a, a uh, geometric a geometric sequence will always have the form a n equals some number times a n minus one. It will always work like that because it's geometric. So there's a couple ways to work this out. Um, one is to say, oh, well, I I I'm going to have the form it. I'll start over with a n. This equals some number, and you know, I don't want to call it n anymore. Let's call it um, r. r is the multiplier. And so a n will equal big A times r to the n power. And then a is often this first value. There might be an exception. Okay. So for this one, uh, if you plug in 0 for n, right, then you'll have r to the 0. You'll have just a. a will be the total. So a is 5 in this case times, well, what's the multiplier? What's the ratio? That's why I wanted to do this part first. Well, to go from one term to the next, you multiply by 0 0.1. That's the R value. Or if you want, 1 over 10. So there you go. That is the um, post form for that one. So if you have a geometric formula and I, you identify the, um, the recursive form first, the closed form is not that hard because it's geometric anyway. Okay, how about this one? Um, looking at this one, it looks like I'm doubling every time we go forward. Time, 5 times 2 is 10, times 2 is 20, times 2 is 40. Okay, so the recursive version, A0, is going to be 5. And then A n is going to be uh, 2 times A n minus 1. Okay, so then I can say that A n equals 5 times 2 to the nth power. Okay. And if you plug in, say this is position 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, you plug in 5 for n, 2 to the 5th power is 32, times 5 is 160. So there you go. This one's a little bit harder. This one may not be geometric. Um, so let's see. Let's Maybe this one's arithmetic. If I try geometric first, and I look at well, what's 9 fifths, that could be the ratio. Divide... Um, one term by the one before it, because that could give us r. If you if you say that a sub n equals r times a n minus 1, you divide both sides by a uh, sub n minus 1, you get a to the n over a sub n minus 1 equals r. So when you have a geometric uh, sequence, you can always do try this. And you just do a couple of terms to see if you do get a common pattern. Well, 17 over 9 is not the same as 9 fifths. And 33 over 17 is not the same as 70 over 9. So this is not geometric. However, notice that if we if we do subtractions or additions rather, add 4, add 8, add 16, add 32. Hey, this number is half of that one, which is half of that one, which is half of that one. So there is a geometric thing going on, but it's off by a bit. What do I mean by that? When the differences in your um, successive terms follow a clear geometric pattern, then there is a geometric pattern, but you have to work a little bit harder to find it. So what I'm going to do is the following. I'm going to say, okay, what if I subtracted 1 from each term? I get 4, 8, 16, 32, 64, and so forth. So if I can find... Um, a, a closed form for this one and then add one to each term that would give me the closed form for this one and we'll worry about the the um recursive one after that so 
Uh, this is clearly geometric. I'm doubling terms as I go, right? So this will be a sub n. In fact, let's call this one b sub n. a sub n is the one we started with. So b sub n, this is going to be, well, 4 times 2 to the n power. Now, a sub n is one more than that. Okay, so this is uh, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, the fourth position. a sub 4 equals 4 times 2 to the fourth power plus 1 equals 4 times 16 plus 1. So 64 plus 1 is 65 which is what we have. So there we go. That's it. It's The original sequence is not quite geometric, but there is an underlying geometric pattern. It's um, off. It's one off of being geometric, so that's something to look out for. How about the recursive version? Well, let's see. There's a couple ways to think about this one, I think. So um, the sequence itself is not geometric, but it has a geometric thing going on. So what if I what if I did this? If I kind of find a way to strip this off, I can say, okay, a zero equals five, right? Because it is, that's the starting point. I'm gonna say that a n is equal to two times a n minus one minus one plus one. Where do I get that? Well, if I subtract one, before I do my doubling, then I'm affecting the geometric portion, right? I'm out of room here. Okay, let's do this. Let's do this. So four times two to the M minus one power plus one equals two times, forgot it already, four times, four times, 2 to the n minus 1 plus 1, because that's that's what this is, right? The closed form that we found. But then I have to do the rest of this, minus 1 plus 1. So these cancel. And I get 2 times 4 times 2 n minus 1 plus 1. So I get... Uh, 4 times 2 times 2n minus 1 plus 1. So I get 4 times, I'm going to combine these. That 2 is 2 to the first power, and I have like bases. So 1 plus n minus 1 would be n. Which equals a to the n, as it should, right? Using the, the uh, closed form. So yeah, this is the correct recursion the recursive definition for that sequence. And so there's not a single method with these. Depending on what you're given, look for an arithmetic uh, pattern, look for a geometric pattern, but you might have to make an adjustment because it's not quite one or the other. Okay. This one says find a closed form for the recursively defined sequence. Okay. So we're given this. Now one way we're given A1 is 2. So we're starting at 1, not 0. That's fine. And a n equals 4 times a n minus 1. Okay. So one thing to do would be to think about, oh, is this geometric or not? Because I am multiplying term by term. Another would be to write out a bunch of terms and look at them and then and go from there. And that's not always necessary, but I think with this one, it's a good idea. So a1 is 2. Okay. Again, we're starting at 1, but that's fine. And then to get the next term, we just multiply the one we have by 4. So 2 times 4 is 8, and then 32, and then what is that? going to be um, 128, and then 512, and then uh, 2048. Dot, dot, dot. So yeah, this is clearly geometric. And really what I can do is take this equation and divide uh, a sub uh, a uh, sub n minus 1 on both sides. And see, oh, there's a, um, oh, there's a ratio between the terms. So this is definitely geometric. This, this is basically R, okay? And then this is kind of my A value, sort of. The, the, the format for geometric sequences I come up with earlier was based upon having 
a0 be the first term. So I need to have a geometric formula where a1 is 2. Okay, so if I start with the assumption that I had before, and I'm almost out of room here, let's do this. Basically, I'd say, okay, well, a sub n equals big A times r to the n power. Now, r is 4. Now, if I plug in 1 into n here, I'm going to have a times 4 to the first power, so a times 4. So if I want 2 to equal that, I have to divide by 4 on both sides, and I get 1 half for a. So a needs to be 1 half. So uh, my close form will be a sub n equals 1 half times 4 to the n power. And that's because I have to pay attention to where does my sequence start. Am I starting with n equals 0, n equals 1, n equals 2? It just depends. So we have to look out for that. Anyway, this, this is the result there. Okay, what's next? Okay, now, now we talk about limits. So the limit of a sequence is a little bit like a limit of a function. Um, basically, the reason for that is a sequence is a function. What do I mean by that? So if I look at this sequence, I could say, oh, well, I could say that a sub n, the closed form, okay, is, um, say, uh, 2 to the n power. And n starts with 0 in this case, okay? So n is the input value, and then 2 to the n is the output value. So really, a sequence is a function from what are called the natural numbers to the real numbers, okay? So let's put it over here. is a function from, and meaning from mean that the inputs would be real numbers from, or rather, uh, uh, natural numbers. From the natural numbers, which is often written by double struct n like that, to the real numbers. which is often written with a double struct R, okay? So the input is a natural number. The uh, output is a real number, which it could, so far they've been whole numbers, but they, oh, we've had some fractions and you could have roots and all kinds of stuff. Um, what are the natural numbers? Like, you know what real numbers are, but what are natural numbers? The natural numbers is the following set of numbers. And different books use different definitions. I'm gonna say zero, one, two, three, or dot, dot, dot. It's, it's all of those. So it's the non-negative integers, in other words. So we'll use this um, notation from time to time, this double struck n, and that just means this list of numbers is the numbers we're talking about, or, or is the list of the numbers that we were talking about. Okay, so just like you, have a, you can have a limit of a function, you can have a limit of a sequence. Now, since the input set of numbers for the domain rather for a sequence is not real numbers so you can't have like oh x goes to one because if you look at this list of numbers i probably shouldn't have zoomed out if you go to one well how do you get there there's no 1.5 there's no 1.1 there's no point 1.01 so how do you get to one so having a limit of a sequence as n goes to one or two or five doesn't really doesn't mean a lot but this sequence of numbers and the natural numbers, in a sense, are themselves a sequence, kind of. It's a list of numbers, right? Just like we can have x go to infinity, we can have n go to infinity. You can, you can look for the n behavior of a function. Well, you can look, look for the n behavior of a sequence. We don't call it that. We just call it the limit of the sequence. So here I can say, well, when n goes to infinity, if I look at more terms of the sequence, what's going to happen in the value, right? So I'm going to say that um, uh, a goes to infinity for this one, because this is clearly geometric, or in fact, I should probably do this. Uh, some books will use capital letters to refer to names of sequences as well. Um, some do, some don't, it just depends. How about this one? One over two of the n powers, n goes to infinity. Where do these numbers go? If you think about it, you'll have one over one, one over two, one over four, one over eight, one over 16, and so forth. So. 
it might be obvious that this goes to zero. Just thinking about what, what are the numbers doing when n gets really, really large? What are the numbers doing? Okay, how about this one? And we're going to have, at some point, some that are more complicated, that we need to break things apart. Um, we could break this into two sequences. We're not there yet, but I think we'll be able to do soon enough. One thing to think about, if this seems really foreign, this is what we did um, in Cal 1 with um, Riemann sums. And then also the beginning of Cal 2, where n goes to infinity, the number of rectangles goes to infinity. We really were kind of talking about sequences at that point, because how do you have half a rectangle? How do you have a third of a rectangle? Well, you don't. You have a, you have a distinct number of rectangles. You have 10 or 100 or 1,000. So we were talking about Riemann sums and limits of Riemann sums. Those were sequences. We just didn't call them that at the time. So for this one, I can look at it and recognize, oh, well, this is going to go to zero, right? When n goes to infinity, 1 over 3 of the n power goes to zero, and the 2 is just a 2. So I can say, oh, well, this goes to 2, right? That's relatively straightforward because it's a relatively easy uh, function or sequence. This one, not so much. This one's probably a quite a bit... Um, this one, well, this one is harder than the previous one, obviously, but it, it also might be... It might seem easier than it really is also, potentially. There's ways to deal with this that we haven't gotten to yet, but we will soon enough. So basically, one way to deal with this, and this is more descriptive than um, explanatory, but just like in the previous example, let's go to the one before it, this one. The, the bottom becomes very, very large, and the top does not. The top stays at one, and the bottom gets larger and larger and larger, so the limit is zero because you have one divided by a huge number, essentially. And then similarly here. 2 minus 1 over a huge number is essentially 2 minus 0, right, in the limit. Here, again, this is descriptive, not explanatory, but what, what becomes larger first or faster, right? And we could also work out a few terms that might help to, to, to make that more concrete. So let's say, um, let's start with uh, 1, because we can't start with 0 here, right? n can't be 0, so we'll start with 1. So... 2 to the 1 power is 2 over 1 squared sub 2. Okay, then what if n is 2? Well, you have 2 squared is 4 over 2 squared is 4 to the 1. And then put in 3, so you'll have 8 over 9. Right? And then put in 4, so you'll have 16 over 16, right? And then put in 5, so you'll have 32 over 25. And then put in 6. So you'll have 64 over 36. And then put in 7. So we'll have 128 over 49. And you're probably starting to see a pattern. If you, if you haven't already, then probably now. Put in 8. We'll have um, 256 over 64, which I guess um, reduces to 4. 6 over 64. Yeah, it's 4. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll put it this way. That's, that's cause to, to see the pattern that's emerging, although that is a whole number at that point. Um, we're almost out of room. Let's do this. If I put in 9, what do I get? So 2 to the ninth is uh, 512. Oops. 512 over um, 81. And then 1024 over 100. Okay, so the top is getting bigger faster. Initially, we saw the numbers shrink, and then they got bigger, and then they kept getting bigger. Like the ratios were getting larger as we went along. So one way to describe what's happening is that the top is growing faster than the bottom. The top is exponential. The bottom is quadratic. So this goes to infinity okay the, the the top gets bigger a lot faster than the bottom does initially eh, not so much but as you follow this out that that does hold up this might not be satisfying and mathematically it's not very precise it's it's more like i said it's, this is descriptive not explanatory um so we'll do more detail on this later there is a way to make this totally concrete and and, and to do it in a more mathematical way 
Um, but we'll get to that a little bit later. Okay, so what's next? Salmon limits graphically. So, got this this uh, sequence. Um, a sub n equals cosine of n. And in calculus, um, trig functions always use radian measures for their inputs, uh, with rare exceptions. So we're going to assume, oh, well, n is going to be interpreted as a radian measure. But of course, n will go 1, 2, 3. There are no pi's involved. Okay. So i got my calculator. I'm going to do cosine of 1. In fact, let's do cosine of 0. Let's do that. Cosine of 0 is, of course, 1. I don't know why I did that in the calculator. So 1. Okay. And cosine of 1. So 0.54. So about right here. Okay. And then cosine of 2. A negative about 0.42. So right about there. Cosine of 3. Negative 0.1, essentially. Cosine of 4. So negative 0.65. Cosine of 5, 0.28-ish. Cosine of 6, 0.96. Hmm. A little bit closer than that. Eh, it's fine. Cosine of 7. I'm not sure how many we'll do. 0.75. There, and then cosine of 8. Maybe that's enough. Negative 0.15 right there roughly so you know good old cosine right and it, it just oscillates back and forth and um you know it, it follows the cosine pattern of course the function has discrete points not a curve but it's just gonna kind of wave up and down between negative one and one and it will never really settle on anything it won't go anywhere so this um um doesn't have a limit okay so d and e or I, or I should say limit does not exist because I haven't written limit yet. Does not exist. Um, later, we'll have a term for this, which is, I guess we can have now. So if, if you find a limit, you'll say that the sequence converges to the limit. For functions, we didn't use that term, but for integrals, we have. Um, so we'll say that this one diverges in the pre, 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 in, sorry, in the prepared examples. That's later, actually, but we can do it now. How about this one? A sub n of cosine of 1 over n. And of course, uh, n can't be 0 in this case because you can't divide by 0. So if n is 1, then I find cosine of 1, right? So about 0.54, about there. If n is 2, then I have cosine of 1 half, so about 0.88, right about there. Uh, then cosine of 1 third. 0.94, right about there, I guess, and then cosine of 1 fourth, so 0.97, right there, I guess, and cosine of 1 fifth, so 0.98, it's getting harder to draw, cosine of 1 sixth, 0.986, right there, I guess, close enough, and then cosine of 1 seventh. And you're starting to see a pattern, uh, about 0.99. That's not close enough, I think. Here we go. And then cosine of 1 8th. 0.992. So right there, which I'm going to call that closer. So you can see that, yeah, this, this limit is 1 a sub n goes to 1, right? Like you, you can look at it and you just see it. It's, it's, it's obvious from the picture, right? How would we do this, um, you know, algebraically or, or with, with, you know, without a calculator? Well, we'll get to that. But I just wanted to look at this graphically as well and get a visual for what's going on and, and connect this with limits of functions done graphically. You can look at it. It's just with um, a sequence. It's not a curved graph. It's, it's discrete dots. Okay, what's next? So, definition, limit, limit of a sequence. And this is part of why I was doing doing this, is because this might remind you of the limit of a function using the epsilon delta definition. So, given a sequence, 
a sub n. If the terms a sub n can be made arbitrarily close to some real number l, which, you know, these are getting closer to 1, right? l will be a y coordinate, it's the output. By choosing sufficiently large values of n, by moving forward, moving farther down the sequence, then we will say that the limit of the sequence is l. So in this case, the limit is 1. Or in other words, we'd say that the sequence converges to 1. So we say the limit is 1. The sequence converges to 1. Two different ways to say the same thing. Okay, so this, you might remember from Cal 1 that there is a way of saying what limits are, limits of functions. It's really kind of vague and it uses terms like arbitrarily and sufficiently, right? And that certainly is not very mathematical. I, I think that you guys probably more or less know what it means. Um, well, you might, you might know very well what it means. But even if you, you never really grasp the epsilon delta part, which we'll get to in a moment, like this concept of, well, if you get, if your inputs are really close to this thing here, then you're going to get an output that's really close to this other thing over there, which hopefully everyone gets that. And that's basically what this is saying. You can do the same thing with a sequence. Well, here's the formal definition. And there's some more stuff below that we'll get to as we go along. So given a sequence a sub n, if there's a real number l, such that for any real number epsilon greater than zero, there is a number n in n, the natural numbers, such that if little n is greater than or equal to big N, then the absolute value of a sub n minus l is less than epsilon, then we will say that a sub n goes to l. This is basically a rephrasing of the epsilon delta definition for functions taking into account the fact that sequences aren't functions of real numbers. So there's no, there's no delta, right? But we're going to say, okay, for any real number epsilon greater than zero, meaning the, like the error tolerance in the output, if you have some position in the sequence such that for the rest of the numbers in the sequence, um, all of those output values are within that epsilon error of the number L, well, then they're getting close to and staying close to L. So that's the limit. That's exactly what this is saying. And it's really just a reframing of the epsilon delta definition for functions, for the limit of a function put into terms of a sequence. But it's really the same concept. So if that made sense in Cal 1, rest assured this is the same thing. <clears throat> and um, we're not going to do a lot with this, this definition. Um, in, in the class, but I have to at least point it out. We won't really do any proofs. So th this is what I was saying earlier, that we, we had some terminology a little bit ahead of time. So a sequence that has a limit is said to converge to that limit and is also called a convergent sequence. Let me fix that there. A convergent sequence, okay. A sequence, that, a sequence that does not converge to a limit is called divergent, which we used earlier. Okay, so this is a really useful thing, and this is going to allow us to put different examples on a more concrete footing as to how we solve them. So the limit of a sequence defined by a function. And given a sequence a sub n, if there is some function f of x of a real variable and some number big N in n, the natural numbers, such that f of little n equals a sub little n for all little n greater than or equal to big N, if there is a uh, and L in the real numbers such that the limit as X goes to infinity of FX is L, then the sequence A sub N converges to L, okay? Uh, earlier, um, I I didn't, in, in my speech, distinguish little N from big N. I'll try to do that from here on out. So I was talking about this, this formal definition, and I just said N in N, and then N greater than or equal to N. On the screen, you can see it. The, the little N and the big N are different. Um, so, yeah. Here, I, I took care to, to say it correctly. Okay, so how about this one? A sub n equals 1 over n. What's the limit? And we could say, oh, well, if n gets really big, this goes to 0. But I don't want to do it that way. I want to say, no, no, we need to come up with a function that matches what this sequence does. And then we can use the techniques of Cal 1 to find the limit. Okay. So what I can do is say, well, um, if... 
f of x equals 1 over x, then f of n equals 1 over n, right? And we know from, from Cal 1, the limit as x goes to infinity of 1 over x equals 0. Therefore, 1 over n as a sequence goes to 0. Because this is something we've already justified previously. And, and when we did justify it, we probably said things like, oh, well, x gets really big. We probably did say that. But we're going to say in Cal 2 that this reasoning holds up. If we can use this to connect back to something from Cal 1, we can go ahead and do that. And it's always valid as long as we do, as long as we find the correct limit for the function based on the tools of Cal 1, we can use those tools to deal with sequences. That's basically what that says. Okay. So limit properties. These are basically all inherited from functions because, as I said, sequences are functions in the sense that they take inputs and give outputs. So suppose you have two convergent sequences, uh, little a sub n goes to big A and little b sub n goes to big B, and you got a real number k. Then the sequence k converges to k. It's a constant sequence. So the sequence would go like 2, 2, 2, 2, 2, 2, 2. All the numbers in the sequence are 2. Well, the limit's 2. Kind of like the constant function. If you have f of x equals 2, the limit would be 2. So sequence k times a sub n, well, that's going to be the same as k times a sequence a sub n, and that goes to k times a. You have a sum of two sequences, then the limit will just be the sum of the two limits. Okay, The, uh, the limit of the sum is the sum of the limits, essentially. So the difference, same thing. The, the limit of a difference of two sequences will be the difference of the limits of the two sequences. Also, we can use the product rule. Basically, a sub n times b sub n, the limit will just be a, b. And then we have quotient rule as well, inherited from limits of functions. Of course, you can't have division by zero, so this only works when b is not zero. Okay, so let's do this. Let's find the limit of each sequence below. And we're going to use some justifications that we've been using previously. We're relying on some justifications we've done previously. So if I do 5 and minus 2 separately, this clearly goes to 5. And then uh, 2 over n squared. Well, this equals 2 um, times 1 over n squared. And we already know that 1 over n goes to 0, right? So this would go to 2 times 0 times 0, or 0 squared if you want. So this goes to 5 minus 0. If I do the two terms separately, and I get 5, okay? What I could do if I wanted is I could write this as the sequence... 5 minus 2 over n squared equals the sequence 5 minus, oops, close brace there, minus the sequence 2 over n squared, which equals, uh, well, if I want, I can do this way. 5 minus 2 times 1 over n times the sequence 1 over n. And then this all goes to 5 minus 2 times 0 times 0. Which equals 5. So there's, there's two ways to write out the justification, but it's essentially the same thing. Okay, how about this one? So with this one, I could say, well, I could say that f of x equals to the x over x squared, right? And as long as I can find the limit of this as x goes to infinity, well, then I can find the, this limit, right? So the limit as x goes to infinity to the x over x squared. And you, you might hesitate and say, oh, well, how are we going to do that, right? But remember, we have 
from Cal 1, L'Hopital's rule. And in the numerator, if you if you let x go to infinity, you'll have infinity on top. And the denominator, if you let x go to infinity, you'll have infinity on bottom. So I can apply L'Hopital's rule and say, oh, well, this is the limit as x goes to infinity of ln of 2 times 2 to the x all over 2x. And again, in the numerator, if you let x go to infinity, you get infinity on top. And in the denominator, if you let x go to infinity, you get infinity on bottom. OK, well, let me do L'Hopital's rule again. So this equals the limit as x goes to infinity of, well, ln of 2 squared times 2 to the x over 2. So now I just have some number times 2 to the x. Right? This is the limit as x goes to infinity, uh, some number, I just call it n times 2 to the x. n is uh, ln of 2 squared over 2, but that's not important right now. What is important is that this goes to infinity, right? 2 to the x. Think about the graph of an exponential function. So I get infinity. Okay. So by using this function, I can go do things like L'Hopital's rule, because I can use calculus on a function of a real variable, and I can find the limit of this sequence. So then I know that uh, 2 to the n over n squared goes to infinity because of this justification here. Okay. All right. How about this one? Now, this one, I might not have enough room here. This one's fairly involved. And this, this is something you may have done in Cal 1. So I'm going to say, well, f of x, which I guess it could be saying g of x, but that doesn't matter too much. f of x equals 1 plus 1 over x to the x power. Okay. And what I could do, in fact, is let's do this. Let's say y equals. I think I want y equals. Yeah, let's do that. Okay, so I'm going to apply the natural logarithm to both sides. Okay, so this equals x times ln of 1 plus 1 over x which if I want, I could rewrite as x, x plus 1 over x. Um, that's optional. Yeah, let's do that. I'm not 100% sure if that's going to really help yet, but we can do that. So if I can find the limit of this, I can then use it to find the limit of this. Okay, and I think, yeah, let's do this. So the limit as x goes to infinity of x ln of x plus 1 over x. OK, this equals, and I think that separation I had in mind is, will actually work well. So x times ln of x plus 1 over, or rather, minus ln of x. That might help us. We'll see. So looking at these two factors, this, this goes to infinity. And this one, where does this go? Well, this goes to 0. So we have the indeter indeterminate form um, infinity times 0. And, and similarly, this goes to infinity, and this goes to 0. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to rewrite this as the following. Limit as x goes to infinity of big fraction. ln of x plus 1 minus ln of x, all over x to the negative 1 power. Okay. So now if we're going to infinity, right, x is going to infinity, this will go to 0, and so will this. So I have the form 0 over 0, so I can use L'Hopital's rule. So this equals the limit as x goes to infinity, and you're seeing now, I think, why I, I separated to two logarithms. 1 over x plus 1 
I should zoom in there. 1 over x plus 1 minus 1 over x all over uh, negative 1 over x squared. Right? So let's multiply um let's multiply by I think x squared on top and bottom there. That that might help. I think that will help. We might have to backtrack. Anyway, on top, well, sorry, so we have limit x goes to infinity. And then on top, we have x squared over x plus 1. minus x all over negative 1. So I have limit as x goes to infinity of, I'm going to divide the negative 1 into the numerator and switch the order of the terms. So this will be uh, x minus x squared over x plus 1. Okay. So am I out of room? Yeah, getting there. Getting there. Let's create some more room. This equals the limit. X goes to infinity of, I want a common denominator here. This is x over 1. I'll write this as x squared plus x over x plus 1. Now I can add the numerators together, and I get the limit as x goes to infinity okay, of x over x plus 1. And this is an easy limit. You might recognize the result that we get here, right? We get 1. So we get that the limit as x goes to infinity of ln of y equals 1, okay? Because uh, we found the limit of this, but, but that is equal to ln of y, right? Well, sorry, here. x times ln of x plus 1 over x, that is equal to ln of y. So we found the limit of x times ln of x plus 1 over x. So we have ln of y, the limit of that. So what I can do now is say, okay, well, I can apply the base E exponential function to both sides, right? And E is continuous, so this gives me um, the limit, cutting corners here a little bit, as x goes to infinity of y equals E. Therefore, we can conclude that the limit of, well, it's not a conclusion, I suppose, but limit as x goes to infinity of 1 plus 1 over x. The x power equals e, which this is something you've probably done in Cal 1. So in conclusion, I have to do it over here. So conclusion. So I'm out of room. Conclusion. Um, 1 plus 1 over n to the n power. This goes to e. So sometimes a sequence can have a fairly complicated resolution when you want to find the limit. It just depends. Okay, so this is essentially what we just used. Um, continuous functions defined on. Defined on. Yeah, in some sense, we've already used this for the prior example. Yeah, given a convergence sequence from uh, a, a sub n goes to L, if a function f is continuous at L, then there is some big N in N, the natural number, such that f of a sub n is defined for all N, all little n, rather, greater than or equal to big N, and the sequence f of a sub little n converges to f of L. Okay, um, So basically, you, you use a function to break apart um, a sequence that's complicated and find the limit of a piece of it, and then say, well, now I know that the the, the previous sequence, the original one, converges to f of l, which is essentially what we did here, right? In um, 
this this step is essentially what we did. I was able to rearrange this, but I did it with the function, the Cal1 tools. This is saying, no, no, you just you just do it with n is essentially what this is saying. You don't have to switch to using x. Okay, so how about this one? Find the limit of sine of 2 times n to the minus 2 power. Okay, well, I'm going to rewrite this sine of 2 over n squared. Well, I know that 2 over n squared goes to 0. We, we looked at a very similar one previously, right? And I know that sine is continuous at 0. It's a trig, trig, the trig functions are all continuous at all their domain values. Okay, so since that sequence is convergent and sine is continuous there, then f of that sequence, sine in this case, converges to f of l. So this converges to sine of zero because of, this is the justification. And this, of course, equals zero. So the limit is zero. Okay, and we, we don't have to switch to using x to do this as long as we're using continuous functions. We just do it with n, and it's totally fine. Okay, squeeze theorem. So this is basically, if you recall the squeeze theorem from Cal1, it's the same thing with very minor changes in, in basically you're referring to sequences, not functions of a real variable, but that's basically it. So given sequences a sub n, b sub n, c sub n, if a sub n and c sub n both converge to some real number l, and there is some uh, natural number big N, such that a sub n is less than or equal to b sub n, is less than or equal to c sub n for all little n greater than or equal to that big N, then b sub n converges to l. Let's take the time to examine more. We've been using this a couple of times, but really dig down on what this means for all little n greater than or equal to big N. Let me find um, some empty space. This will work. Okay, so I'm going to switch to a smaller style so we have plenty of room. So, so there is some big N in the natural numbers. And then we say uh, something about dot 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 uh, for all little n greater than or equal to big n. What does that mean, right? So basically, the idea of the tail is what's going on here. The tail determines the behavior of the sequence. We talk about convergence. So if I draw out a sequence, kind of like the cosine ones we did before, and I have something like this. And let me change something here. Okay. Um, this one's drawn kind of bad. Let me fix it. Let's say this is some L, right? So you can see that the sequence seems to converge to L. Um, all of these guys are really close, right? So it seems like the, the, the dots aren't jumping up and down anymore. They're settling down into one steady position. This one's way lower. And this one's quite a bit higher. So if we count what position that is, say, okay, here's, um, start with one. And we'll pretend I drew this better. Two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. 10, that's a big outlier, 11, 12. Okay, so from 12 onward, they all stay close to L, right? So this is the tail in big N equals 12, okay? So whenever you are talking about convergence or, or behavior of a sequence, it's the tail that matters. These other terms, they don't matter at all. Like if I went and changed it and said, okay, actually, actually, Three isn't there. Three is here. That's where three is. Right? That doesn't affect the tail. The tail is what matters. We talk, we talk about convergence. Okay? So that's what the um, big N is doing. It's talking about how far forward you have to go 
and it, it just skip a bunch of terms or doing crazy stuff and go to a point where it's like, well, from here on forward, there's a very clear pattern. It's all jumbled over here. But I don't care about that. I care about the pattern over here. That's that's what we're talking about with that big N. Okay. So where were we? Here. Squeeze theorem. So basically, if you have a, a complicated sequence that you don't know how to handle, but you can compare it to two much easier ones, um, as long as that sequence that is hard to handle is squeezed between, between the easier ones um, beyond some certain point in the sequence, in the tail, then you can go, oh, I know the convergence because I have these two other sequences to compare it to. We've got this one. And if you recall doing the squeeze theorem in Cal 1, then you probably know what to expect. Um, cosine n, well, that's between negative 1 and positive 1, right? If I divide by n across the board here, negative 1 over n, so that's 3 equal to cosine n. So that's 3 equal to 1 over n. And this is true for all n except n equals 0, right? Because you can't divide by 0. So for all n greater or equal to 1, of course. This, se this sequence wouldn't start at 0 at all. Okay. Well, I know that this sequence goes to 0, right? Because n gets large, and this sequence goes to 0. So as a result, as a consequence, um, oh, I didn't divide by n here. Sorry. As a consequence, this sequence goes to zero. So that goes to zero. And I don't have to do much more than that. I just have to justify this by saying, well, I'm using the squeeze theorem. So I can't test, say, squeeze theorem. Say you're doing it. Set up the inequality. Make sure it's correct. And then draw your conclusion. That's basically it. How about this one? Negative one half to the n power. Okay. Well, let's draw some a few terms to see why this might seem problematic. But if n is zero, then this is going to be a, a one. If n is one, this is negative one half. If n is two, this is one fourth. If n is three, this is negative one eighth. If n is uh, four, four. This is one over sixteen. Oops, not negative. Positive one over sixteen. Then negative 1 over 32, then 1 over 64. Uh, so the numbers are shrinking, and they're alternating plus, minus, plus, minus, plus, minus. So they're jumping around. But um, I could say this. Um, negative 1 half to the n power, right? This is less than or equal to 1 half to the n power. Right? Not alternating, just positive and steadily shrinking in size. And greater than or equal to negative one half to the n power, with of course the negative outside the parentheses. So this sequence is always negative, but consistently shrinking in size, getting closer to zero. This guy goes to zero, right? This is geometric, right? Shrinks to zero. This guy goes to zero, it's geometric shrinks to zero. You have a, a growing exponent on a small base, right? Shrinks to zero. Therefore, we can conclude, I'm running out of space here, conclude that this goes to zero. So this goes to zero okay, based on the squeeze theorem. Okay, what's next? Banded sequences. So I, I decided not to have like this pre-written out because I just wanted to say what it is. Um, there's not a whole lot to say. Basically, a bounded sequence kind of sounds like what you probably think it means. So is there a boundary? Is there a maximum value and a minimum value? So um, if, so let's say this one, given, given a sequence, a sub n. Probably should start with that. If there is some, let's say, um, Big M, such that uh, A sub N is less than or greater than, or sorry, uh, less than or equal to, rather, not greater than, less than or equal to big M. And yeah, for all, for all N, not just some of them, but for all of them. And that's a distinction you might think, well, really, is that, is that something we have to, couldn't we exclude some of them? Well. 
for, for reasons we, we could get into in the live session, no, you don't need that condition, just for all of them. Then the sequence is bounded above. Basically, there's a number that is greater than all the numbers in the sequence, you know, individually, not put together or anything. Well, then there's an upper boundary. There's a maximum that you can't get above. Um, if there is some, let's say, little m, such that um, a sub n is greater than or equal to little m. for all n in, all little n in the natural numbers. Then sequence a sub n is bounded below. And uh, if both are true, we'll just say that the sequence is bounded. Next is, uh, well, this is just a statement. Convergent sequences are bounded. So if you have a sequence that is convergent, it's automatically bounded. That The opposite is not necessarily true. There's 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 uh, conditions on that. So you wouldn't say a sequence that is bounded is automatically convergent. That's, that's not necessarily true at all because maybe it's only bounded above, it's only bounded below. Uh, but convergent sequences have to be bounded. You could have a, you could have a sequence that um, oscillates up, down, up, down. So like the sequence... Uh, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, dot, dot, dot. That's bounded, right? It's bounded above by 2 if you want. It's bounded below by negative 1 if you want. It's definitely bounded. The numbers don't get big, but it's not convergent. It oscillates back and forth. It never settles on anything, right? So a bounded, sec a, a bounded sequence might be convergent, but a convergent sequence is bounded automatically. Now, monotone sequences. So there's another thing I, I didn't want to pre-write. Pre so basically, monotone means um, having one type of change. And you know what monotone is in, in you know just general usage, like someone has a monotone voice. Hey, someone we all know, perhaps. Um, so a monotone sequence is one basically that only increases or only decreases. So, so let's say uh, given a sequence a sub n if a sub n plus 1 is greater than or equal to a sub n for all n in the natural numbers then uh, the sequence is called increasing because each next term is greater. You could say it's an increasing sequence or just say it's increasing. Um, and I guess that's a bullet point. If, if a sub n plus one is less than or equal to a sub n for all little n in the natural numbers, meaning for every term in the sequence, then a sub n is called decreasing, which maybe that was not surprising. Um, in either case, the sequence is called monotone because it's only increasing or only decreasing. So we know what a bounded sequence is. Sequence. <laughs> we know what a bounded sequence is, and we know what a monotone sequence is. Okay. So bounded sequences can't have huge values, huge numbers. 
um, and then monotone sequences can't increase and decrease. They have to pick one and stick with it. Okay. So the next thing is the monotone convergence theorem. If a sequence is bounded and monotone, then it is convergent. So this was the other half. I said earlier, every convergent sequence must be bounded, but bounded sequences aren't necessarily convergent. But if they're bounded and monotone, then they are convergent. So this is something where um, we could talk about why and talk about like basically draw a picture and look at it. But if you think about if a function, well, say a sequence can only increase, can only go up, but it also has a maximum value that it can't pass, then it's going to run into that value at some point, right? It can only increase and it's got a maximum that can't pass. Well, it'll hit that. If a function, rather sequence, if a sequence can, and this applies to functions as well, but if a sequence can only decrease and it has a minimum, well, then it's going to run into that minimum and get stuck there. That's basically the reasoning. Let's look at this one. So this is one where you might not be so familiar with this notation. This is called n factorial. So we should talk about what that means a little bit first. So let's say I had something like, um, let's say I had this. So we're gonna go back to elementary school. If I had like three times five, this is like saying, oops, this is like saying five plus five plus five. One interpretation of what multiplication is, is that it's repeated addition, right? You could also do something like um, five cubed, right? This is five times five times five. So an exponent, one interpretation is you have a repeated multiplication, right? And basically by definition, by definition, that's what it is. But what if you wanted to have repeated addition? Like you wanted to do one plus two plus three plus four plus five. So there's something from Cal one where you could say, oh, well, I want the sum as I goes from, sum of I, I goes from one to say five, right? So that's the sigma notation, these saw in Cal one, and then again in Cal two. So this is one plus two plus three plus four plus five. So you have repeated addition of, of a pattern of numbers. They're not all the same. What if you want repeated multiplication? So there, there is a broad way to do this because this um, i could be some function of i, it could be i squared or i cubed over seven or whatever you want, right? Um, so there is a way to have sort of an arbitrary um, repeated product. And we're not going to do that. We're going to do something a little bit more limited in scope. What if I wanted something like one times two times three times four times five? The notation for that is five with an exclamation point. It's called five factorial. So you're multiplying from one and then two and three and four up to five and then that total. So this would be um, 120, for example, right? So n factorial means whatever number you have, you're going to multiply one, two, three, four up, up to that number. So 18 factorial, you'd have one times two times three times four times five dot, 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 times 16 times 17 times 18 and stop there. Right, so big number. So, um, is this bounded and is it monotone? Because if it is, if it's both of those things, then it's convergent, okay? So first we could show maybe that this is monotone. I think that's the way to start. So let's, let's work out a few terms and see what they look like. Okay, so if I put in uh, the zero, you can't put it. Well, no, you actually can't put zero in. So one factorial, is one zero factorial is also one for reasons we can get into at a different time. So if I put in uh, zero, I will get uh, four to the zero power, which is one over one. So I get one. If I put in one, I get four to the first power, which is four over one, which is four. Looks like it's increasing, huh? If I put in, uh, say, two, I'll have 16 over two, so eight. Still increasing. If I put in Three, I'll have four to the third power is 64, right? Over six, so 32 over three. Oh, it's small now, right? Hmm. Okay, so what if I put in uh, four at this point? Yeah, four, four to the fourth power, that's gonna be uh, 256 over four factorial. So 256 over four factorial, so four times three times two, so 24. 
right? Which that reduces, of course, right? So that's going to be, um, let's see, 128 over 12 or 64 over 6 or 32 over 3. Ah, we have the same value twice, 32 over 3. Interesting, this did not increase, okay? So it's not monotone all the time, but that's going to be okay. You'll see why. So what about if I put in 5? So I have 4 to the 5th over 5 factorial, which we already worked out was 120. So 4 to the 5th, I guess I should get a calculator at some point just to make things easier and quicker. So 1,024 over 120, which definitely reduces. Um, can I get a calculator to do this for me and keep a fraction? I cannot. But I get 256 over 3. Okay. So what if we put in 6? In fact, let's not erase that. 4 to the 6th over 720. 6 factorial is 720. So what's 4 to the 6th? So 4096 over 720. So, so that's going to be uh, 512 over 90. Okay, and at some point we might want decimals for this. Okay. Yeah, let's do one more. 720 times 7 is 5040. So 4 to the 7th. That's 16384. So kind of a big number over 50, 40. Yeah, so I'm going to have to do a little bit more legwork with this one. So 16384 divided by uh, 4, 4096, and 5040 divided by 4, so 1260. It still reduces by at least by 4. So 4096 divided by 4, I get 1024. And then 1260 divided by 4 would be 315, I believe. 315. Um, that might be it, because the numerator is only divisible by 2, and the bottom is not even. So 1024 over 315. And of course, there's more, dot, 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 right? There's, there's lots more, of course. But let's turn some of these into decimals and see what we have. Okay, so 1, 4, that's the ratio, 1, 4, 8. So, uh, was this 10 point six six repeating? Right? And then same thing. And then 356 over 3, 256 over 3 rather. 85.3 repeating. And 512 over 90. So I get 5.68 repeating. That might be an error. We will double check that. And then 1024 over 315. 3.25, and I don't see repeat. There, there is a pattern, but it's going to be very long. So I'll just say 3.25. It's rounded, of course. Uh, this might be an outlier. Let's double check that that's right. So 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. 4 to the 5th over 5 factorial, which is 120, right? 2 times 3 times 4 times 5. Yeah, 120. 4 to the 5th. Divided by 120. Okay, I just made an error writing this down. I think that was 32. That's probably why. Hmm. Okay, so 1024 over 120 times 3. So 256 over 30. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep, so I forgot a zero there, so that decimal goes there instead. Okay. All right. So we have some decimals to work with, and the the largest one 
is is repeated actually it shows up twice 32 over 3 shows up twice so the the values increase and then they decrease after that so can i show that after um n equals say 3 or 4 that this only decreases i notice that this is always positive right this is always positive there are no negatives so it's definitely bounded below for sure right so if I can say, oh, is it decreasing always, then I know it's convergent. Okay. So how do we show that? Well, there's a couple ways to get started. Um, let me do this. What I want to show, to show that it's decreasing, right? I want to show that a sub n plus 1 is less than or equal to a sub n. And there's a couple of ways to do that, and I, I think... I'm going to do the one, of course, I think is going to be the easiest. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to write down, use this formula to write down a sub n plus 1. So basically, in the exponent here and in the factorial here, the, the, I'll put n plus 1 instead because that's, it, that's the index is n plus 1 for, for that term. Okay, so 4 to the n plus 1 power over n plus 1 factorial, which we may need to talk about a little bit. We'll put a question mark here because this is this is in doubt, right? We're doing a comparison, essentially. Is this less than 4 to the n power over n factorial? Okay? So, what I'm going to do is notice two things. One, that 4 to the n plus 1 is equal to 4 to the n times 4 to the 1. Okay? which I could just write as 4 to the n times 4. The other thing I'm going to notice is the following. Because of the way factorials are defined, okay, n plus 1 factorial means 1 times 2 times 3 times 4 times 5 dot 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 times n minus 1 times n times n plus 1, okay? If you think about numbers in a sequence, if I have 1 two, three, four, five. And I say, oh, I want one times two times three, one times two times three times four times five. So essentially, whatever your factorial is, you gather up everything from one up to that point and you multiply. So four factorial is one times two times three times four, right? So I could say, oh, well, five factorial, this would be the same as five times four factorial in, in parentheses if you want to be careful, right? Because this guy says 1 times 2 times 3 times 4. If I multiply 5, that's what 5 factorial means. Okay? So, if I had a sequence of numbers like the following, if I had, say, uh, say 1, 2, 3, 4, dot, 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 n plus, uh, rather, n, rather, and then n plus 1. Multiplying all of these is n factorial. Multiplying all of these is n plus 1 factorial. Okay? So, n plus 1 factorial, this is the same as n plus 1 times n factorial, because it's n plus 1 times all the rest together. Okay, hopefully that makes sense. So this equals n factorial times n plus 1. The, the order in which you write doesn't really matter. So over here, I'm going to write the left-hand side in the following way. I'm going to say that this is uh, 4 to the n times 4 over n factorial times n plus 1 less than or equal to, question mark, 4 to the n over n factorial. And now what I'm going to do is some canceling. I'm going to multiply both sides by the reciprocal of the right-hand side. And I get a bunch of cancellation. So those 4 to the n's cancel, n factorial's cancel, in factorials cancel, 4 the n's cancel. 
So on the left, I have 4 over n plus 1 less than or equal to question mark 1. Okay. And now I'm almost done. I've done the hard part. Essentially, what I'm trying to do is find out what, what number do I have to start with so that this inequality is always true. What does big N have to be? So I'll multiply n plus 1 on both sides. Subtract 1 on both sides. So as long as I choose big N equals 3, then a sub n plus 1 is less than or equal to a sub n for all n greater than or equal to big N. Now, when we talked about being bounded, um, it will be, rather being monotone. We talked about being monotone. We'd say, oh, well, the functions, sorry, the sequence is decreasing if each next term is less. And I referred to doing that for the whole sequence. But really, it's the tail that matters. Okay, so a, a, a sequence that is monotonically decreasing on its tail still qualifies for this monotone convergence theorem. Okay, so if the sequence does something crazy at the beginning, and then at a certain point, stops bouncing around and then only decreases, then it qualifies. So for this one, the function increases, increases, decreases, stays flat, and then only decreases afterward, then it qualifies for the monotone convergence theorem. The, the first few terms don't affect the result. It's the tail that matters. Okay, and that's basically it. This is all the stuff we need for sequences. I think I'm not forgetting anything. No, this is everything we need for sequences. Um, so that's a lot of material for this first section, but there's a lot of terminology and we had to review limits a little bit um, and basically dredge up a bunch of stuff from Cal 1 that you may not have seen in a while. Um, but we're going to use all of this in the next, in the rest of the chapter, in the next several sections.